Wow, did he unpack that or what? <laughs> wow, that was so powerful. Thank you, thank you. And um, I know we're ready. Also, we're going to transition into our uh, panel discussion. But can we just one more time give him another hand and thank you for sharing truth. That was just true. In our face, true. Neither going to, you know, mm -mm, good or was ouch. Right? <laughs> And it all works for good. Amen. So let's get ready. I'm so excited to see um, our next group of panelists here. Um, this is going to be uh, including the, the day here um, as we look at the human justice issue from another side. And so I'm going to ask if they would come up at this time. We have Elizabeth Glazier. We have KJ Lee. Elizabeth Glazier is the mayor's office uh, from the mayor's office of criminal justice. We have K.J. Reed, the Deputy Director for the Center for New Leadership. Judith Green, Director for Justice Strategies at Harvard Kennedy School. And amen, amen, Vinny Shiraldi. He's the senior, it's a private joke, Senior Research Fellow from Harvard Kennedy School. In addition, we have Reverend Ruben Austria, um, who is the Executive Director for Community Connections for Youth. And our moderator today will be Reverend Dr. Divine Fryer, who is executive director for Center for New Leadership and my partner uh, with the co-founding the People's Police Academy, Reverend Dr. Divine Carter. Can we all come and can we all give them a hand as they come? Wait a minute, we're missing one. I'm sorry, we are missing a, a sign. Um, where's my buddy? Where's my buddy? Where's my buddy? Where's my buddy? No, I'm missing one for um, Cottrell. Come, come up, come up, come up. So you're going to be up here moderating anyway, yeah, I know. so you are just going to be there, but I'm going to take your name away because he needs to sit there. I have a question. I'm going to pass out these uh, cards so that when it comes time for the Q&A part, uh, we'll be able to take your cards and ask the questions so that we can move expeditiously. Thank you. Thank you, Q. Uh, so good afternoon. How's everyone? Good. I don't know how many people carried over from this morning, but I thought this morning's session was very exceptional. Uh, mm -hmm. And you should know that uh, we are in a period of transformation and change. We don't know how long this opportunity will be before us, but I think that it's up to us to seize the moment. And so while we're in this era, that we should do everything possible. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do pure moderation this afternoon, which means that I'm not going to give a whole lot of commentary. Uh, in fact, I'm going to give very little. It might be shocking. Uh, but what I want to do is provide our exceptional panel uh, with the opportunity to offer us uh, their perspectives on the reduction um, of crime uh, in New York City, particularly as it has been outlined in the recent report that was released. Uh, so I'm going to ask a very general question, and um, I don't know which end I'm going to start from. I, I think that uh, I should start in the middle. Okay. So good. So I'm going to start with uh, Judith Green. Uh, and I know that um, Judith is very familiar with the report, uh, but basically what this report really uh, outlines and describes is the fact that there has been a, a major reduction, at least statistically, in crime. Now, I know to the persons oh, yeah. who have lost loved ones, and uh, part of you know that attachment, uh, statistics mean nothing to you. So I want you to know we understand that. But overall, as you look at the numbers uh, and you compare it to years prior, uh, what we are seeing is a decline. And what we're interested in today uh, is not only uh, what the report outlines, but we want to also hear from the expertise of our panelists and how they think we can continue this decline. So we're going to start, uh, and we're going to ask, uh, this is how I want to do it. I'm going to start in the middle, and then I'm going to go over to Vinny, back to KJ, over to Ruben, over to Ms. Glazer, and then we'll uh, end with Ruben. And I want to ask each one of them to give us about 
If I say four minutes, you're going to take seven anyway. So let me just give you the seven up front. Let each person take seven minutes and talk to us about the response that you had from the report, your involvement with the report, if you had any, and what does the report say to you specifically as it relates to the work that you do? Hi. Good afternoon. I'm so delighted to be here. Um, sorry I missed the morning. I probably should have come sooner, but here I am. I'm Judy Green. I'm not at Harvard. Um, I'm in Brooklyn, although today I'm in the Bronx. Uh, I run a very small um, uh, policy research group called Justice Strategies. You can find us at www.justicestrategies.org on the internet. Um, and I uh, was one of two authors, Vinny and I wrote Better by Half, um, and now it falls to me to give the most um, difficult presentation or boring or whatever because, you know, throwing numbers, throwing statistics at people is you know, not a lot of fun, and it isn't going to be fun for you either, but, you know, maybe if you can just track, it's kind of impossible to talk about how New York City um, is probably leading the country in terms of reducing its reliance on um, incarceration, jail, and prison without throwing you a lot of statistics. So um, let me start by... Um, Noting that, you know, I myself, if anyone had asked me 25 years ago what was in store for New York City in terms of crime or uh, corrections or probation or whatever, um, you know, I probably wouldn't have been able to predict where we have got to, but where we have got to, 25 years of activities, organizing, advocacy, um, and, uh, uh, and good responses from local and state level public officials um, has brought New York City to um, a more than 50% reliance on locking people up. Um, and as you probably, you, know, you may not know that, but what you probably do know is that New York City leads the nation in terms of re reductions in our rate of crime, violent crime, property crime, um, you know, uh, starting in, in 1990, actually, we began to see declines um, a couple of years before the, Giuli the you know, Giuliani administration and the first um, period that uh, Bill Bratton was in charge of the police. Um, it was Bratton, of course, who made it made New York famous as leading the country in terms of declining crime rates, but he didn't start it going. Uh, it started um, under David Dinkins. So uh, from 1996 to um, 2014, the city's crime rate declined uh, much more rapidly than index crime uh, declined nationally. Between 96 and 2014, uh, index crime, that means both violent and property together, declined by 58%, while uh, nationally, crime was declining everywhere, um, but not at our rate. The, the national um, decline in that period uh, in both violent and property crime uh, combined was only 42%. So there you see us, we truly are the national leader. The 50 states have had at least some decline in their state prison incarceration rates. Um, most of that decline happened um, from two, year 2000 um, and 2015 is the last year we have national data. So when I cite these statistics, you'll see that um, the time periods change according to the data availability. Uh, but going back um, to taking a look at, looking at each state from the year where their 
state prison population peaked to what it is or what it was um, in uh, 2014 or 2015, three states lead the country. We're actually number two. With your help, we can become number one. And this is, we're, we're, probably, we're number two in terms of the impact of decarceration on state prison populations. New Jersey is a little bit ahead of us. They've had a decline of 31%. New York is at 28%. Um, and California is bringing up, um, uh, point, you know, the third place position. Um, so when we started looking at the data, tracing, trying to figure out why our state prison population was declining, um, well, one of the first things we noticed was that it was all driven by New York City. New York City's incarceration rate, in terms of the number of people that they send to state prison, has fallen dramatically. Um, while the rest of the state has actually seen an increase, but because New York City has sent historically so many people to prison, um, a great, a dramatic decline uh, in how many people were sentenced to prison during you know, since the year 2000, which was the peak at the state level, um, has driven down the whole population by 28%, even though the upstate, you know, was increasing the number of people they were sending to prison, and they gave us no help. Um, if the rest of the state uh, had um, done the kind of things that happened here in New York, which I'm going to try to tell you as quickly as I can, um, uh, the, the, the whole state would probably have been able to reach uh, 50%. So, um, you know, how did our incarcerate start so, you know, grow so far? Those of you who, uh, who are a little deaf will remember that in the mid-80s, um, nationally, there was a, you know, what sociologists call a moral panic about drugs, drug use, drug sales violence uh, associated with drug markets. Um, and New York City was no exception. Um, starting in 1985 um, with NYPD's Operation Pressure Point in the, in the East Village, and then built on that experience, um, the, the police department was sending squads of by and undercover and by and bus officers, they call it, and as it spread around the city, they began calling it Operation TNT. I'm sure the Bronx saw a lot of that action. And in fact, one of the more notable members of uh, the TNT effort in the Bronx uh, was Bernie Terrick, and whose name is going to come up again quickly. I got to move as fast as I can here. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly how to get through this. I, maybe I'll just stop telling you what the impact was in various indicators and invite you to take a look at our report. It's on my website. It's called Better by Half. Again, www.justicestrategies.net. And it certainly is also on the, the Harvard uh, website. Um, but, you know, what happened the big driver of both the drop in incarceration at the New York City level and which, as I said, ex it, it, it is, it exceeded 50%, 50% fewer people on Rikers Island or on the, right, on the city jail system, um, and it, which drove a 28% decline in the number of prisoners upstate. And you may know that um, uh, Governor Cuomo has closed 13 state prison facilities, saved quite a bit of money. Um, not, not only was all of that driven by what happened in 19, in, in, two, in the year 2000 in New York City, but what happened in New York City was that uh, Bernie Carrick, who had been appointed to be head of the NYPD, um, by Mayor Giuliani, um, having come up from buy and bust operations in the Bronx to become the head of uh, the city jail system, and then finally um, the NYPD commissioner, he basically be began to dismantle the city's intense 
um, activities in relation to you know the war on drugs. Um, in, in the in the eighties, the late eighties, when all of these you know TNT and Operation Pressure Point uh, had started, um, there were about eleven 1, hundred or so officers assigned uh, to the tactical narcotic squads uh, in New York. Um, and by um, by the time that um, the Commissioner Carrick, uh, Carrick came into the picture, um, that had more than doubled. Um, but then by 2006, uh, it had declined again to actually fewer officers that had been in the uh, tactical narcotics unit when the whole war started. So it went like this, and then Carrick came in, having you know built his credibility as a drug warrior, and decided to begin shutting it down. That I guess he figured that New York City had other priorities, and um, among other things, um, he actually has taken advantage of something that Commissioner Ben Ward had put in place, where if you volunteer coming out of the academy. Um, to do um, three years of, you know, down and dirty, buy and bust, undercover work on the streets of New York City, you could earn, you know, um, a detective's gold badge, take off your uniform, put on a suit, have a desk, you know, and a, and a big hiking pay. So the incentive for people in the drug task force um, uh, was uh, you know less, um, and as people got their promotions, they weren't replaced. So by 2006 already, we had we had stopped doing, uh, and of course, um, I mean from the police point of view, we had stopped doing all this um, open air market, drug market enforcement because um, the, we'd won the drug war. Um, you know, I had a lot to tell you about what the impact of that was, not just at the state, the state uh, level, but also uh, the impact on our, our, our jail system. Um, the population of our jails is like around 9,000 now. When I came to New York in 1981, um, it was 18, 19,000. At the height of the drug war, it was uh, I think 22,000, so that's a huge drop. Um, and instead of spewing more statistics back to you, I just want to point out that New York leads the country in terms of our reduction in crime, and in, in, in property and violent crime. Um, we're second in, this, in the uh, country in terms of having reduced the number of people that we send upstate to the prison system. We're probably, if we haven't been able to look yet in detail at other major cities, we plan to do that, but we're probably at the lead, leading the pack if you combine the reduction in prisoners in the jail system with the reduction in prisoners upstate. Um, between 1991 and um, 2014, the um, combined jail and prison incarceration rate fell um, from 802 per 100,000 New York state citizens, or New York City citizens and state citizens, um, to 400, which is the incarceration rate for New York City this last year. Um, it, it, meanwhile, in the rest of the entire country, the incarceration rose from 477 to 675. So, you know, not only are we, you know, are we leading the pack, but most other jurisdictions in the country are still stacking up bodies in their state prisons and their local jail. From 1991 and again to um, 2014, um, the New York City crime rate, this is the violent crime rate, the one that everyone is rightfully most concerned about, fell from 2,300 a year to 624. Um, and so it's a sweet story. We have 50% fewer prisoners 
coming from New York City in or going upstate. We have 73% fewer violent crimes. And, you know, what more can I say? Congratulations, New York City. Here. Thank, thank you, Jim. So, so because my parents are, are not being quite as cooperative as I'd like them to be, God bless them, I'm going to kind of change the order. So I'm going to go to Ruben, to Reverend Ruben, Austria. Since I know all the panelists and I kind of know their energy, I'm going to have to mix it up a little bit uh, and see if we can uh, flow. So I'm going to probably change the little note that I'm going to put in front of you. Uh, and uh, um, they'll be interesting. But uh, uh, Reverend Ruben, Austria, Based on your reading of the report uh, and the work that you do and your contribution to it, I'm sure, uh, tell us what you got out of the report. So I think you know the big the, the big headline on the report is right, New York City cuts the number or New York cuts the number of people incarcerated by half. Violent crime goes down. Um, something that's kind of really unprecedented in in a lot of places and. I, I just want to bring out, I think, a couple of the factors of the why that, that I heard um, uh, Vinny and Judah talk about the last time that really rang true for me as somebody who's been working in this field for about two decades. Um, and that two, uh, uh, three factors that, that, that they brought out, and I hope I'm not stealing your presentation, Vinny, um, but three factors that led to that concurrent decrease in incarceration, not compromising public safety. One was uh, the emergence of community-based alternatives um, that often were homegrown, that came from organizations uh, like CASES, the Center for Community Alternatives, uh, Brox Connect, the Dome Project, Friends of Island Academy, basically private nonprofit organizations that even in the height of the Giuliani era where everything was aimed at locking uh, people up, uh, these organizations stepped forward and said, you know, we think that this young person or this individual uh, who has this history and is con c convicted of or, or being charged with this crime, we think that we could keep this person home by providing an extra level of support, supervision services, um, and really ranging from everything depending on if it was a young person, connecting them to mentors and positive youth development activity, somebody slightly older, getting them back into school, getting them into work, um, various types of, of really concrete, tangible supports offered, and what people came to understand, and, and I understood this just from uh, one young person at first was, was going before the court uh, with an 18-year-old who was uh, charged with a gun, a gun offense and the judge just saying, I think this young person can turn his life around, he's not going to do it without support, find him a mentor and I'll give him youthful offender status. And us bringing in a formerly incarcerated mentor to meet with the judge said, okay, I believe this guy can get this young person on the right track, I'll release him to your custody. Um, and so one of the, the kind of hidden stories that I think uh, is often not told, is the push of community-based alternatives um, who have been doing this work for a couple of decades, even when it wasn't official government policy to rely on alternatives. Uh, they could get the respect of judges, they could, uh, you know, get begrudgingly the respect of prosecutors, uh, they definitely would work hand-in-hand -hand with the defense attorneys, and these organizations, if you look around New York, really make up an infrastructure of options um, for somebody who's looking at that person that really could kind of go either way. And the judge is saying, I, you know, I see this history, I see, you know, the factors, I see all the stuff that's going wrong, but I believe that if this young person has more support in the community, it's going to work out. Um, the, the second factor, I would say, um, you know, and Vinny spoke about this, is the existence in New York, and particularly New York City, of a really vigorous uh, group of advocates who have consistently been pushing the envelope um, really on the horrors of the justice system, how expensive it is, how badly it works, how racially biased it is, um, and, and basically just hammering over and over again and saying what we are doing is not working. And, and I'll just give you some statistics on the juvenile side that kind of back that up. When we were sending most of our young people upstate uh, the studies came back, 89% of the boys and 81% of the girls would reoffend within three years. Uh, we were spending close to a quarter million dollars per young person to incarcerate just one young person. Um, and that number, the cost continues to go up. Of the young people that we were sending upstate, about 99% of them from New York City were youth of color. So we weren't even talking about disproportionate minority confinement, we were talking about total minority confinement. Wow. Right? And so for advocates to continue to hammer these points home over and over again, 
to protest the expansion of jails, uh, to talk about uh, the, the horror of facilities, to talk about the racial disparities. Again, going back to the Giuliani era, a lot of that was completely from the outside, just a voice crying in the wilderness saying, this is wrong, this is not right, this is unjust. And I think what you've seen over the next couple of administrations uh, is a progressive understanding that yeah, we can't just be tough on crime, we have to be smart on crime. And even getting to the point now where more and more system administrators are at a place of really understanding what advocates have been pushing for a long time. And so I think the third factor, um, and again, Vinny, you made this point, is that even if you look at the New York City story and even the story in New York State, you have something happen where people who have been advocates, people who have done community work, uh, have kind of infiltrated these systems and, and like Vinny, have become a commissioner of probation, right? Uh, Liz Glazer has become director of the, the, the criminal justice coordinator's office. People like Gladys Cajon, who's from the Bronx, becoming the commissioner of the New York State Office of Children and Family Services, and who from a now very powerful position inside the system decided to say, one of the best things I can do to bring about change in my system uh, is not to tinker around the edges to make it uh, a little bit more humane, but actually to downsize it dramatically. Uh, Gladys Camion went into OCFS with the idea of saying, I want to expose how bad this system is, I want to gut it, I want to rip it apart, um, and, and, and in combination with advocates, in combination with New York City pushing to get the kids back, in many ways succeeded in doing that, where there's probably less than 10 juvenile prisons now upstate, where there was 30 um, about 10 years ago, right? So, so this combination of factors, right, the presence of actual community-based alternatives, the fight of advocates, um, and then certain progressive leaders coming in who really, who really decided to take some bold steps and to do things very differently, uh, not to practice institutional maintenance. Um, uh, I think that's been the combination that's got us to the point. But if I have, can I have 60 more seconds? Sure. So the one thing that I wanted to say that when I read the report, the piece that, that just hit me is that this is, uh, we, we, cele we can celebrate reduction in crime, right? We can celebrate reduction in incarceration. Two points that I want to make. One is that the system, for those who are still in it, is just as brutal and awful and terrible uh, as it has been. And I just went through it with one of our young people um, who basically spent the weekend going from the precinct to the court to the barge to all of this stuff and you just see how much this thing is like a meat grinder and it's still horrible for people who are in it. Um, but number two, and this is the point that I want to raise, and it's a point I want to raise for our advocacy work, uh, for our policy work, um, we have done a really good job of, of cutting crime and cutting incarceration. What we haven't done as good a job of doing is reinvesting the millions and millions of dollars that are spent on incarceration into genuine community resources. And I want to just give you a few figures. Um, about 10 years ago, they started building the new courthouse uh, in the Bronx. Uh, budgeted for $250 million. Uh, final cost was $400 million. Of course. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, in a uh, 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 couple, last summer, uh, you know, there was a spike in, a uh, supposed spike in crime in the early spring, and uh, the Commissioner Bratton advocated for money for new cops, and they got 1,300 new cops at a price tag of $170 million. Okay. The 40th Precinct, also in my neighborhood down there, is getting a new precinct at the cost of $70 million. And right now, the city has a proposal um, as part of moving the young people off of Rikers, which should happen, and, and, and that definitely needs to happen, but to renovate two detention centers at a cost of $300 million. And so I bring up all of these numbers to say that if we are successfully bringing down crime and incarceration, if we were to put a, a, a concomitant uh, investment in communities at the rate that we invest in prisons, police, jails, and courts, uh, do you know what would happen? If we took that $170 million and, and we said instead of hiring 1,300 new police officers <laughs> to deal with the combat in crime, what if we hired 1,300 men and women formerly incarcerated who live uh, in NYCHA, who live in the neighborhoods where these kids come from, who can talk to them, who are credible messengers, who've been proven to reduce crime, we would see some gains that I think would outstrip anything that could come from policing. Um, we would see not just 
community safety increase, but we would see something that we're talking about in terms of community thriving and flourishing. Because what we know is that even when criminal justice policies are effective, the most that they can do is suppress crime. But our young people and our communities are worth more than suppression, they're worth investment, and I'll close with that. Thank you so much.